I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Bruce A. Collette, who is professor in the School of Educational Foundations, Leadership and Policy at Bowling Green State University, and Dr. Luis Fernando Macias, an assistant professor of Chicano and Latin American Studies at California State University, Fresno. And he's an alum of BGSU's Cross-Cultural and International Education Program. Bruce regularly teaches graduate level education courses and has a particular interest in research regarding immigrant and refugee education, liberal multiculturalism, and religious education. And Bruce is here under the auspices of the ICS Faculty Fellowship Program this semester. Luis specializes in post-secondary educational practices and policies regarding immigrant youth. He previously worked as a Board of Immigration Appeals accredited representative with Diocesan Migrant and Refugee Services, an immigration legal aid clinic on the U.S.-Mexico border. Tonight, Bruce and Luis are sharing their new research, supported by an ICS faculty fellowship, on the role of sanctuary churches and school districts in performing resistance to policies and rhetoric that target immigrant populations. Bruce and Luis, I'm delighted to have you here. I will hand it over to you now. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jolie, for this opportunity. And in fact, I'd like to uh, thank the Center, the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, um, and Jolie and all of her incredible students for, for helping us um, uh, with, with our research and our, our work. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen here, and hopefully this all works out. So you'd probably be getting a glimpse into my computer world there, and then hopefully um, you see our presentation there. So, um, okay, so uh, sacred mobilization, sanctuary churches and sanctuary schools. Um, uh, Luis and I are honored to, to be here and to talk about this, um, this ongoing, very present <laughs> project. Um, so let me, let me talk you, tell you a little bit about this study that we're involved in and, um, and the different phases that we have, where we've been and where we are and where we hope to go. Um, I think as, as the title of the presentation suggests, um, this is a comparison uh, of, of church sanctuaries and public school districts that have declared themselves as sanctuary jurisdictions or sanctuary school districts, which we find just fascinating given, given the, 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 the very deep and long history of the sanctuary tradition. So in essence, really, it's a study of the new sanctuary movement um, in, in both its, um, its secular and its sacred manifestations. And we're very interested in how those things possibly overlap. So um, uh, we have many questions coming into the study, and I think we'll reveal those uh, as we go through our, you know, our, our present methods and, and plus a, a bit of a review of our, um, the first piece that we've now published on, on this study. Um, so uh, talking about the phases of the study, um, um, we, we began, I, I don't know, Louise, maybe three years ago? Does that sound about right? Yes, Bruce, uh, approximately about three years ago through back yeah. and phone, phone calls, text messages, emails started tossing around the idea that is now this, this uh, research. Yes, I know, I know it was pre-pandemic <laughs> because I was meeting with my graduate students who are helping us uh, on this project. Um, I'm gonna mention them in a minute because I really do wanna uh, send a shout out to their, for their hard work. Um, but I was meeting with them in person about this stuff so I, without masks. So I know we were doing this in a pre-pandemic stage of our lives. Um, and at this time, what we did was we, we were, it was simply a document analysis. We, we were very interested in looking at sanctuary resolutions, uh, those that were being um, uh, created and signed and enacted on the part of uh, secular uh, uh, jurisdictions, in our case, because we're educationists, uh, particularly uh, uh, school districts, public school districts, and also um, uh, sanctuary resolutions being um, enacted by, by churches, sometimes by individual churches and very often by entire dioceses, which was a fascinating conversation in and of itself. And so we, we, we did a small, a small examination of, of um, 10 uh, school districts and 10 churches. Uh, that is the uh, resolution language. Um, and um, I'm going to, as we, as we go through this, I'm, I'll, I'll provide little synopses, of, that's, if that's a, the plural form of that word, um, of, 
of, um, of that research. Uh, the, the bulk of our presentation really is about our present work, to, um, um, but I will provide some uh, summaries of, um, of that resolution study. Now, the second phase here um, is interviews with sponsors of these resolutions, as well as other leaders within the new sanctuary movement. So what we've, what we've done now and what ICS is generously allowing us to do, because it's providing um, well, at least me with some release time. And I think Louise, you were able to get a bit of teaching release time to this academic year is we're, we're getting out there and we're talking to folks, you know, um, we'll talk about the, you know, the inherent limitations in all of our, our, there's always limitations in research. And one of the major limitations of the first phase of the study is you're not actually talking to anybody. You're just doing this document analysis and you're not actually talking to the sponsors. You can't really gauge the degree to which these resolutions are actually being enacted, right? And, and, and carried out in practice. And you don't, you don't really get us to see the spaces. So the second phase was to get out into the field and start meeting with folks, meet with the folks who wrote these resolutions and other actors who are involved in, in, in carrying out the things that people have resolved to do. Um, and then as, as any research project goes, you know, once you kind of light a, a fire under its belly, um, it takes you in all sorts of unpredictable and creative directions. And so what Luis and I have found ourselves doing now is not only talking to the church and school sponsors of these resolutions, but other actors within the sanctuary theater, a lot of like, for example, uh, advocacy groups and nonprofit organizations. Uh, I've talked to a couple of interfaith councils now. And, uh, um, so there's a lot of really fascinating, interesting folk out there who are involved in the new sanctuary movement. And so I think this, this inevitably happens when you get out into the field, you meet people and then sort of by a kind of snowball way, you meet other people and things blossom. So it certainly is beginning to take on a life of its own. Now, a, a, a hopefully third phase of this, uh, this sanctuary study will be doing um, interviews and maybe focus groups with Act with, with actual sanctuary recipients, quote unquote, those people who directly benefit from these practices. Now that, it, that takes some time and a lot of trust building to, to be able to do that kind of thing. So we're not, we're, we're not um, a purposely, at least right now, setting out to talk to people who are actually seeking physical sanctuary, nor students because they're minors and we need, we'll need to go through another, um, well, ethical review and all that, but that is a, a third uh, uh, eventual stage of the project, getting out and talking to sanctuary recipients. So those are the three phases of the study. Um, I was mentioning before, I'll just, I'll just say it now, the first, the first phase of the study has been published in uh, the journal Compare, a journal of comparative international education. Um, it was entitled, uh, pretty much the same title, I think, as this presentation, Sacred Mobilizations, Sanctuary Churches and Sanctuary Schools. Um, that was published in 2021, uh, this year. Um, and um, we can provide the citation for that. If uh, you, I'm sure you could contact one of us or provide, we'll just give you the article. So that's, that's what's happening there. Um, I'm gonna speed through <laughs> a very a short history of, of sanctuary. Uh, it says the sanctuary there. I'm not sure why I wrote that. Should, we could just say the, a short history of the sanctuary movement or a short history of sanctuary, uh, particularly um, uh, in, in the US context. Interestingly, you know, sanctuary is, an, is, is, is international um, and that's a whole other very interesting discussion about how the new sanctuary movement's manifesting itself, uh, particularly in Europe um, and the UK. Um, but uh, if we go, uh, uh, to, to point number one here, early forms of church sanctuary. And I just want to use this as an opportunity to, to kind of talk about the etymology of sanctuary, but the word sanctuary itself. You know, sanctuary is, it has the Latin roots of sac sac sacra or S-A-C-R and also sanctus. And these two um, both invoke the concept of holy. So the etymology of the word itself allows us to go back or really brings us back to this notion of a, a sacred phenomenon, right? Um, or uh, as it was enacted in, in the early church, a kind of special cultural jurisdiction in a way that, had, that was underpinned by a sacred authority. 
Um, and so the early forms of church sanctuary, and I, I, I'm going to presume some basic familiarity on the part of our, our listeners about this, but we know, we understand that the, the, um, the medieval church would offer sanctuary um, in, in Europe, uh, for example, to, to fugitives, in, some, in many cases, people who were, were rightly guilty of a crime, um, but they would, they would offer them a kind of physical place, right, to be for safety. Um, and it was very interesting because in many cases, this was because the church felt as though, look, we've got jurisdiction over this guy here, excuse the, um, the, the, the gendered <laughs> uh, noun there, but we, we basically have jurisdiction over this person's soul. And this person needs to atone for God, to God for their sin. And, and the, the state can't do that in the same way that we can. So, so um, or secular authorities cannot do that in the same way that we can. So, so the purposes of sanctuary um, within much of medieval Europe were, were, were quite different than the contemporary sanctuary tradition. Although fascinatingly, um, we'll see it in sanctuary resolutions, uh, drawing upon you know, biblical language as a way of kind of rationalizing the uh, provision of sanctuary. So that's a, another interesting conversation just about, about sanctuary in the pre-modern era and sanctuary in the modern era. Well, um, there's been fascinating work done on, on sanctuary and crime in the Middle Ages. I would steer you in the direction of, for example, Carl Shoemaker at University of Wisconsin has done some fascinating work on this. I know it's not the topic of our study, so I'm going to move into uh, to, to the modern period and just quickly talk about um, three major phases of the sanctuary movement in the U.S. context that are often talked about. And this is not, uh, I don't think that this is at all an exhaustive list, and I'm sure that we could think of other iterations of sanctuary, but these are three of the most um, popular. Um, and the first was uh, the sanctuary movement in the Vietnam War period. Um, and uh, I don't know how many of our, our younger listeners might, might know this, but um, during Vietnam, um, during the Vietnam War, there was quite a bit of opposition, of course, to the Vietnam War by many churches uh, um, across the country. And churches, uh, some, some, uh, not, we're not talking about a great many, but some opened their doors to both draft resistors as well as soldiers who were refusing to serve any longer. And so those folks could seek sanctuary in a, in a church. And um, I think there's a lot of very interesting activity that was happening in California um, um, during this period of uh, uh, basically uh, draft resistors, you know, um, and also soldiers refusing to serve any longer who would seek physical sanctuary in the church. Um, a second iteration of sanctuary that's very that's, that's much talked about, um, particularly in, in comparison to the new sanctuary movement, was sanctuary and the Central American crisis of the 1980s. Now, I, uh, Luis and I have uh, both come into this study with some personal background, and I'll just I'll just uh, share mine now very briefly about this. My I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, which is kind of known as a being a little bit of a liberal hub within the Midwest. And um, my, my mother was very involved in the, uh, the American um, uh, Quaker Friends um, and their um, involvement with the uh, sanctuary movement in, in the 1980s. Um, so I learned about this when I was like 12 or 13. I kind of was hearing this, these words like sanctuary and asylum seekers and refugees. Um, and it was a very eye-opening experience for a very young boy <laughs> to hear, but I, so I, I've known about it for a long time and I've always been fascinated by it. Um, any rate, uh, the, so what was happening in the, really this, this stems back to the 1970s and into the 80s and principally the central war, the civil wars in Central America, uh, particularly El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua, um, and the, 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 the flood of, of refugees that those crises produced. Um, um, in no small part in, in relation to our, the U.S. government's um, uh, favoring, right, of, 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 of dictatorships in those countries at the time. So, so the U.S. was quite complicit, in fact, in a lot of that forced migration from Central America. And, and churches um, uh, opened their doors. Now, we're not, uh, I know that a lot of our uh, presentation tonight is focusing on the Christian church, um, but we should not forget 
uh, that synagogues as well and other kinds of faith communities were also offering sanctuary. So this is not just limited to uh, Christian churches. Um, by the mid 1980s, over 150 congregations were involved, were offering uh, sanctuary to people who were seeking asylum. And I, I think that's, that's also a very important um, uh, note to make here. These were, these were bona fide refugees. These were asylum seekers from civil wars in Central America. Um, the, the, the final uh, period, um, the new sanctuary movement, um, uh, is the is is really the the, our, our, the present iteration, um, and it, there's been some interesting shifts now um, uh, in terms of sanctuary provision and really the, the, the sanctuary identity. Um, now the concentration is uh, more so on on undocumented families or undocumented individuals or mixed status households, as we might say sometimes. Uh, but that doesn't preclude asylum cases. We still see sanctuary being provided uh, to asylum seekers too. Um, uh, I was mentioning before that, that the new sanctuary movement has a presence internationally um, uh, and, and there are some very interesting kind of like um, overarching themes that we can see that, that the US shares with other countries that are, have also embraced new sanctuary. Um, one is the response to uh, increasingly restrictive immigration policies. And we saw that very dramatically in the previous administration in the US. Um, a second is an interesting shift towards favoring something called, where we're gonna talk about as, as civic or civil initiatives rather than civil disobedience. And so there's this sense of, of upholding law um, in the face of it being broken or being circumvented. So that's, that's something else we'll, we'll talk about today or tonight. Um, a third theme is a critique, an ongoing critique of other immigration laws and policies. So, so uh, there's some nuance here and we'll, we'll get into that a bit tonight. And then um, fourthly is, is actually providing a more public face um, to sanctuary. That is what we sometimes would talk about as like exposure sanctuaries. So churches, for instance, being very transparent about the fact that they're offering sanctuary. Um, public school districts is making their sanctuary proclamations or identities well known and publicized. Um, in fact, it was, you know, I think it's because of exposure sanctuaries that uh, Luis and I were able to um, download sanctuary resolutions from the internet. You know, this stuff is meant to be read. Um, school sanctuaries are an interesting um, iteration, a very interesting and fairly recent manifestation of, of a kind of secular Kind of sanctuary. We, 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 sanctuary cities um, have some history in the U.S., but but it's interesting that to see this particular kind of secular sanctuary arise. Um, and there's I, I I I have been rather monopolizing the time here. <laughs> and I, Luis is uh, also our partner in this research, and and, and very soon uh, Luis and I are going to be uh, tag teaming uh, through these slides. Um, but, um, and, and Luis, maybe you might want to, uh, if you want to say something else about Plyer v. Doe, but um, the, the Plyer v. Doe decision in 1982 um, upheld a student's 14th Amendment rights um, to equal protection under the law and basically um, uh, upholds the, uh, this includes the rights of undocumented students um, to public education. Uh, Luis, did you want to say anything about, uh, about uh, uh, ways that which we're understanding uh, public school sanctuaries too? Absolutely. Thank you, Bruce. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, I think uh, I see some familiar names in the attendee list. So I hope that some of my students will hear some of the things that we have covered in classes, uh, you know, echoed here that uh, none of these things happened in a silo. None of these things occurred overnight. But um, the, the impression that we want our audience to take away is that oftentimes sanctuary has acted as a response to something. A, be it a law, be it um, civil unrest, be it a combination of thereof. And the Plyler versus Doe Supreme Court decision uh, granted undocumented students the ability to enter public school without any charge, without any sort of tuition, without any sort of limitations. And what we saw then as a result of that was many challenges throughout the United States that wanted to continue the challenge of restricting public education 
for undocumented populations. Majority, if not almost exclusively, folks from the global south, people of color. Uh, so in, in that, just kind of um, for our audience members, just know that we understand all of that nuance. We are working on texturizing all of that in our writing, and it may not find its way explicitly to the slides, but this is all in relation to other larger movements and other pivotal moments in, in uh, U.S. history. Yes, thank you, Luis. And um, I, I guess on and that general point, um, maybe just a uh, a bit of an apology to our, our guests tonight for our, our slides being so simple, but we, did, we really didn't want to crowd our slides too much with a lot of text. We thought we would just sort of fill in the space verbally. And we also understand this is being recorded and transcribed. So that's, uh, thank you technology for that. Um, there's another, uh, uh, there's a couple of important documents that we will be referencing, I think, tonight throughout. Um, one, of course, is the Plyer v. Doe decision, wherein Sanctuary schools are, are in some ways, are, are, are simply just upholding 14th Amendment rights, right? Um, it's, this is, this is a, a perfect example of a, of a civil initiative that's upholding um, uh, students' um, equal access to the law. There's another very interesting um, uh, artifact uh, that we've been studying quite a bit, and that is a fascinating memo produced by Immigration Control and Enforcement in 2011 called the Sensitive Locations Memo. Um, and I, I think maybe at some point later, in, in Luis, if this sounds good to you, at some point later in, this, in the presentation, we can go into a little bit more depth about this memo. And I'll just mention it now. What this memo purported to do, and what it kind of effectively does in, in, in most cases, is um, uh, guide ICE officials, um, ICE acronym silly for Immigration Control and Enforcement, um, not to uh, conduct enforcement activities in sensitive locations. Now, fascinatingly, uh, churches and schools are included in those sensitive locations. Now, this is a this is a, a, a memo. It's it's not a law. Uh, it doesn't really have. I've gotten to an interesting discussion with lawyers about this, but it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have. Um, uh, in capital letters, um, uh, uh, legally legal authority, but it does have an interesting authority within within ICE. So that's um, the sensitive locations memo ends up being a pretty interesting and important document within our work um, because it's often invoked in sanctuary resolutions. Um, they'll quote it as we well as the sensitive locations memo says. Um, ICE officials really aren't supposed to be conducting operations within churches or schools, so that's um, that's an important cultural artifact that we talk about in our study. All right. Well, um, I want to say a, something about our analytical frame, or a bit theoretically about how we are trying to make sense of all this stuff. And, and we've latched, one of the ideas we've latched onto and that we are actively working in right now is this, this notion of a covenant community. Now, covenants is, is very often, I think, associated with, with spiritual communities, like a church covenant, or you, you covenant to do something, a, a kind of, you agree, or formal kind of solemn agreement to carry something out. Um, and at least with respect to churches, uh, there, we can often think of uh, like a, a sort of covenant frame uh, that collectivizes our religious experience in terms of a particular project um, or a project of a sacred community that's going to take, um, going to carry out um, uh, certain activities. Um, we are um, working with the idea of expanding this notion of covenants to include also um, a, a secular uh, uh, iterations of, of sanctuary. Or, or put plainly, um, we're experimenting with this idea that perhaps school communities also comprise a kind of covenant community in as much as they also form a kind of agreement, a sort of solemn and, and, and binding agreement that this is, this is the spirit of the school. This is the mission of the school. Um, you know, it, people often will assume, well, of course, schools should be open to all children. And of course, schools should be places where, where um, children from different ethnic backgrounds meet. And, but, but I think that the past few years have told us <laughs> very plainly and very strongly that there is a sizable constituency within the United States that does not agree with that at all. 
and does not want to see undocumented, particularly undocumented children in our schools, um, and maybe even more generally in many cases, rather frown upon diversity um, uh, within schools. And so um, I, I don't think that we have national covenants when it comes to the mission and the audiences of public schools. Um, and that in some ways strengthens this notion that, that, the, the sec that the sanctuary public school communities might actually be a kind of covenant community. So that's a, an idea that we are, um, we're working through together. Um, and I, th I think I just wanna uh, use that as a quick commentary point to say that um, uh, what we are going to be talking about Particularly with our ongoing interviews right now, is is these are basically snapshots of a of a fast moving train. Right? <laughs> Louise and I are actively in the field right now, conducting interviews, and so this presentation, you know, the second phase of the study is really um, just a, kind of like a, a Polaroid of of um, of a moving train. And and uh, six months from now, it, it we might. Um, be coming out with uh, even more things to say. So I'm going to turn uh, things over to Luis for a few minutes here to guide us through our um, our research methods. Thank you, Bruce. And as Bruce mentioned earlier on in the presentation, this started as as an idea that then transformed into a project that then has taken really on a life of its own. So we're gonna walk you a little bit through how some of those phases have made up the current study. So um, the examination of schools and church resolutions came about through that conversation that, that Bruce and I had that then uh, some graduate students were, were um, really instrumental in helping us collect and helping us figure out which schools, which churches have publicly declared sanctuary for their students, for their congregation. From those uh, resolutions, we then compiled a list of where they were located. And after that, we recognized that all of these places that had the most visible resolutions were in areas of the country that have um, predominant historic immigrant populations within. In the, um, West Coast, uh, I'm looking at California, the Bay Area, Los Angeles, uh, in the East Coast, you're looking at New York, uh, Midwest, Chicago. So we started seeing that there was something really interesting about that that we wanted to further explore. After we compiled the list of the cities, we then uh, mapped out the churches and the schools within those cities. And then we redefined our, our search to find those that had very publicly pronounce themselves to be sanctuaries and use their resolutions as guiding documents to then analyze um, of their actions, their, what is it that they are purporting to do? What do they wanna do with this act of sanctuary? Because sanctuary has such a rich history as many of you here in the session know. Are they tapping into the history? Are they reinventing it? What is it that they're doing with this proclamation of sanctuary? And to the statement that I made earlier about this being in reaction to something, it should come as no surprise that many of these resolutions became public after the uh, Trump administration uh, took over the, the took over the uh, presidential administration of the United States. So um, the second phase of the study is the one that we are currently in. We took those resolutions, we published a paper on it, and then we are now uh, speaking to the actors that form part of those resolutions: church leaders, school leaders and asking them how they came about it. What is it that they envisioned? And like many other things that are worthwhile, they are not easy, they are not, uh, um, they are not a monolith. So we're looking especially into how is it that perhaps there was conflict within the congregation, conflict within that school district. Is the resolution a compromise of different ideals? Is it uniformly more or less what folks envisioned in the beginning? So that's what we're doing now. The third phase of the study is going to be looking at not only folks that have taken up sanctuary, folks that have uh, petitioned for, for sanctuary in both churches and schools, but we're also looking at areas of the country that may not be as welcoming to immigrant populations. And within those areas of the country, speaking to um, church officials, speaking to school officials that are acting very much against the interest of that constituency, that area that in many instances have publicly declared themselves against sanctuary. 
and harkening back to the presidential administration, there was the threat of withholding federal funds for many districts that um, proclaimed themselves to be sanctuaries. If you can uh, switch over to the next slide. Thank you, Bruce. So let's talk a little bit about how is it that we analyze this data. And I think this hopefully is illuminating for, again, uh, the students in, in the in the attendance, in attendance that are oftentimes assigned these articles, looking at how is it that they came about? Well, we, we're very methodical with it. Uh, so for our data analysis, we examined um, the church resolutions. And what we did was we did in vivo coding. So what in vivo coding does is it focuses specifically on the words that were used. If you're doing in vivo coding with audio transcripts, you look at what the person said. If you're looking at, uh, in our case, resolutions, we're looking at what are these words that were uh, put down in the resolutions that were codified in this document. And we looked at the vocabulary specifically in context with that community's culture, that community's worldview. Again, this idea that uh, these places have historic immigrant ties. So we started looking for commonalities there. From that, we then developed the coding matrix that looked at what were these commitments that uh, the resolution had? Were they material commitments? We commit to doing X, Y, and Z, or were they non-material commitments? Okay. From there, um, we performed some um, inductive thematic coding across both the church and the school resolutions. And what you see here are the five coded share groups. We found that in these resolutions, there was uh, the overarching theme of organizational identity. In these resolutions, districts, schools, and churches refer to their identity. This is not who we are, or this is who we are in opposition to the current uh, political climate. Part of that, number two, was the justification and the legitimation of why they were declaring themselves sanctuaries. So not only this is who we are, but this is who we answer to. And um, across church and schools, when we uh, look into here our findings, there were some very interesting overlap and some very interesting differences that we are aware of. And just now through this conversation with the actors are really excited about how is it that there is just so much more to the decision making, so much more to the legitimation of why it is that they declared themselves sanctuary. Sanctuary is protection, protection for whom? for individuals, what kind of protections is another thing that came up. Number four, non-discriminatory provisions of services and a little bit of an extension of the third point. Um, and the fifth, the fifth uh, we found across both churches and schools. And now that we are in um, our, our field work, what we're finding is that this is very prominent across church actors is the theme that arose of organizational support networks and partnerships, an understanding that sanctuary is not in isolation, that in order for folks to really declare themselves and act on sanctuary practices, they have to form part of a team. And um, what those teams look like vary from uh, place to place, vary from um, church to schools, and we'll get into that here in just a second. Um, and the next phase of the research for our analysis is going to be looking at how um, folks from perhaps the same congregation, the same school district, view the, the practices and the promises of sanctuary. How is it that perhaps if we're able to have folks from, um, I'll just say Los Angeles, since I'm going there next week. So folks in Los Angeles, perhaps one of the school administrators and a, a church official, how is it that they um, are, are viewing um, and treating sanctuary. And the last thing I'll say um, so that you all can recognize it across the slides is that across each and every one of these groups, one through five, we further delineated codes that had active commitments in the resolution and reactive commitments. Active commitments were those in which folks vowed to disrupt some sort of immigration enforcement vowed to disrupt some sort of uh, raid. Active disruption are those um, that um, they intended to disrupt not just the policies, but the practices as well. Um, active allocation is one that we found uh, quite often in which um, both schools and churches committed to allocating resources. So if they did not have the capacity or if that was not in their blueprint, 
to actively disrupt immigration enforcement, then we're going to allocate resources. So we have active and then we have reactive. Reactive codes are those in which folks um, talked about limiting access to ICE, um, accessing information from their congregation or their schools, limiting the physical access to spaces. Um, one of the subcodes for reactive was reactive advocacy. So in addition to refusing to cooperate with authorities, the reactive advocacy was um, tying into this support network. We can't do X for you, even though you might need this, but we can point you in a direction that somebody might be able to help. So um, those were our data analysis points. Oops, sorry. Thank you, Luis. See if I can maneuver my slides here well enough. Okay, now I'm, I'm just noticing the time, so I'm going to try to stay mindful of time. It's 7.43 Eastern right now, and so well, let's see if we can finish this within 15 to 20 minutes. Um, we're going to uh, therefore um, uh, try to go rather efficiently. Um, so in terms of uh, organizational identity, again, synopsis from phase one, and Luis is already nicely walking us through actually many of our findings uh, uh, because just through presentation of our thematic codes, I mean, those are, that's the stuff we found out. Um, the basic distinction between schools and churches that we found in our, the first phase of our study was not too surprising. That the sanctuary individual or the sanctuary subject for schools is a person with rights, right? It's a person who has a right to education, a, a, an entitlement to education, um, a constitutional uh, right to, um, to uh, equal protection to the law. And so they're, they're kind of lawfully, uh, what, uh, uh, defined. Um, churches, uh, uh, not surprisingly, again, iterate, had iterations of the sanctuary subject or the sanctuary individual as, as being a member of the faith community. And um, I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on, on that second point as we get into uh, talking about what we're finding out right now. Um, but there was, a, there was a bit more, of course, a, a more spiritual kind of iteration or spiritual understanding of, of a person seeking sanctuary. So those are, those are not shocking things at all. Um, but here are some emerging findings. And what Luis and I have agreed to do is that I'm going to share um, some things that uh, some key points that I've found uh, so far in my interviews. And I'll just mention uh, to the audience that uh, where I've been so far, I've, I spent a week in Chicago uh, talking to a lot of great folks. And then I spent a week in New York and also some time in Boston. And I'm heading out to uh, Denver uh, next week. So um, those are the places we've been so far. Oh, I, I also talked to some folks in, um, in southern Wisconsin um, in Racine. Um, any rate, OK. So one of the things that, that is an emerging finding, um, which is fascinating and so important for us to understand, is that there is the congregational as well as the student body demographic matters significantly when you start talking about sanctuary identities, um, uh, particularly institutional identities, and uh, by extension, sanctuary practices. And one very important thing that we've learned is that there is, um, and we, we knew this, but it's so important to just get out there and meet the folks who are doing this stuff. There's a spectrum of kinds of sanctuary churches. And, and, and on one end of the spectrum, you have an immigrant majority sanctuary church. Now, sometimes we might think about this as like, for example, the classic ethnic church. And in these places, for instance, the, um, the service um, may be conducted entirely in Spanish, right? Um, or I visited uh, uh, a few years back an, an Iraqi uh, Chaldean church where the services were entirely in Chaldean. Um, so the sort of classic uh, immigrant ethnic church. Um, on the other side, though, of the spectrum, and this is a rather, I mean, forgive the distinction, um, you have a kind of immigrant minority sanctuary church that is very well-meaning um, progressive churches um, that uh, uh, are doing really interesting stuff like um, advocacy and also sometimes offering physical sanctuary, um, but have zero or next to zero immigrants within their, <laughs> within their congregations. Um, uh, classic case, um, um, upper middle income, um, uh, um, 
Unitarian church in a, a well-to-do, well-educated community. And that's just, I don't mean to um, stereotype, but but uh, that is a kind of classic example of a, a progressive, well-meaning church that's doing a lot of advocacy work for asylum seekers, but doesn't naturally actually have any asylum seekers within their immediate congregations. Um, that stuff matters a lot um, when it comes to um, how sanctuary practices are being enacted. And it certainly matters with respect to COVID. We're, we're, we're gonna talk about COVID towards the end of our presentation tonight. Um, now, we, we also find a, an interesting kind of, of course, um, spectrum with schools. Uh, on one end of the spectrum, you've got what we call, often call in the US context, newcomer schools. These are schools um, that are specifically designed, public schools, that are specifically designed for the new immigrant student. Right. Um, uh, they have intensive English language programs. Uh, sometimes they have du dual language programs. There's, a, there's some very interesting ones in Washington, D.C., for example. Um, and they are kind of natural homes for sanctuary, right? right? Because they're newcomer schools. But then you would have on, on the other end of the spectrum, or let's just say kind of <laughs> uh, not exactly in that poll, other public schools that are kind of beholden to a sanctuary identity because their school district has embraced a sanctuary identity, even if as a school themselves, they're not necessarily a newcomer school. Maybe they're a magnet school or they have a kind of other focus, but it's not necessarily a focus only on immigrant and refugee students. So, so you've got this to work with. And now those demographics we anticipate are going to matter as well too, as we talk to more and more school principals, we anticipate that happening. So, um, uh, and I'll just give you an example. Um, uh, what's the likelihood of your school having a dreamers club, for instance, or a, a concentrated effort on helping your undocumented students find colleges that are rather blind to immigration status? And what's the likelihood of your school doing that? The likelihood is probably greater if you are in something like a newcomer school where you have a greater concentration of those kids. So um, we're gonna see the practices that support sanctuary are certainly going to be kind of unevenly distributed, I think, across these different kinds of schools. Um, uh, Luis, what would you like to, to add here? I think the, the distinction that we are looking at that, that um, I, I would say it's fair to not say it's a, it's a stereotype or generalization, but it's just quite the reality. And uh, through the interviews that we have done, we have found that pastors of these congregations recognize that they are in a situation where their congregation is well-meaning, they are affluent, their politics are progressive, but they are situated in a place that has been exclusionary for uh, immigrants of color, undocumented immigrants. So in many cases, there's uh, an attempt to create a, a bridge of sorts between this uh, space that is very exclusive in which they live in and their ideals, their morals that are leaning more towards inclusivity. And that dynamic is very, very fascinating. I was just sharing with Bruce before we went live that I have a, I have a research trip planned to Los Angeles and I plan to visit one of these churches that is in a very exclusive, very affluent area and the leadership there has been very welcoming, but forthcoming about the fact that they have declared themselves, they have publicly declared themselves, which is how we found out about them, but nobody thus far has taken up sanctuary, which is gonna be something that, that in the next phase, I really look forward to, to teasing out. And we can imagine because of this uh, divide that exists. Yeah, thank you, Luis, for that. Um, I think the next um, uh, slide here uh, is titled Justification for and Le Legitimation of Sanctuary Identity. And, it, and it, of course, it organically relates to our first slide. Um, uh, a quick synopsis from the first phase of our study is that um, um, there has been, uh, particularly for, for schools, uh, a, a concentration on reactive refusal, what Louise talked about it before, reactive refusal, or, or not directly providing information to uh, information access to immigrant agents, or, and also demands that agents follow the necessary legal steps. Um, uh, um, so that is really the, the, the practice um, and also the basis for, for justifying why they're, why they're uh, proclaiming themselves as sanctuary institutions. Um, another interesting uh, finding that we, we put within this category, and it's fascinating, is, is the use of texts as kind of 
transcendent authorities within, within sanctuary resolutions. So, so for example, a, a church sanctuary resolution might draw a selection from a book of common prayer. Um, a public school district sanctuary resolution may make reference to the 14th amendment. But in essence, they're doing the same thing, right? They're both appealing to some transcendent text as a source of authority and a source of legitimation for their sanctuary practices. And so we thought that that was a very fruitful <laughs> outcome, at least of phase one in terms of comparing document types. Um, emerging phasing, emergent findings from phase two, um, um, I was mentioning before about the, the, the sort of spiritualization of sanctuary, particularly with some churches. I talked to one church that talked about the sanctity of the family and that sanctuary meant perverse, preserving the sanctity of the family and to, to disrupt the sanctity of the family was a sin. And that's profound, right? Because it, it, it provides a, a sort of like, it opens up a, a, a very religious framing of, of sanctuary co in contrast to what was going on, particularly in the Trump administration, where we had these horrible policies of splitting families up and, and tearing them apart. So preserving this, the sanctity of the family, um, uh, that was a fascinating thing that I've, I've, heard, I've heard some uh, uh, reference at churches talking about. For schools, um, much like we taught, we found in our, in our first phase of the study, fulfilling students' rights, prever preserving, if you will, the sanctity of the law. So the, the sanctity of the law becomes uh, uh, first and foremost here particularly equal protection, plier v. Doe, et cetera. Um, I know Luis is going to say something about carrying on the legacy of resistance. So I'm, I'm not going to say anything there at this point. Um, but I will introduce this, uh, this uh, sort of philosophical um, question that's come up for us within the study. And that is the location of sanctuary. And I'm just going to keep that as an open-ended question right now. Where exactly is sanctuary located? Um, it doesn't have to be physical sanctuary for it to be sanctuary. So there's this deep kind of ontological question that we're wrestling with, you know, where exactly does sanctuary reside? Um, uh, so I'll just, I'm going to keep that question floating in the air for a while. And I'm going to turn over to Luis to fill in some more uh, uh, dots here on this. Thank you, Bruce. And we're cognizant of time. And uh, what we'll do is give you some of those um, elaborations that we talked about earlier. And the idea that sanctuary is not one thing is something that we are recognizing more and more during this phase of, of the research. Uh, and to Bruce's comment earlier about an expansion of sanctuary, um, again, for, for those that are familiar with the sanctuary movement from the 80s, it was a very particular uh, movement that had very concrete actions on behalf of the church. The new sanctuary movement is then an evolution of that in which churches are focusing on families that are facing deportation rather than almost exclusively folks that are seeking asylum. Now, because of the limitations to housing somebody in the, in the case of the churches uh, for X amount of years, even months, and, and having a family unit living in a non-residential area, what we are recognizing is that a lot of churches are now expanding what it means to be sanctuary. And I'll give two concrete examples. One is rapid response teams. Churches are getting involved in what is known as a rapid response team. If there is an immigration raid, if there's an immigration enforcement and a family member is detained by ICE, the rapid response teams uh, act on behalf of the families, and they will provide the family that is being impacted by that immigration enforcement with the immediate supports needed so that they see it through the next day. Um, do you have food? Do you have access to telephone numbers? Do you have access to uh, where you can locate your family member? So these rapid response teams are almost always a volunteer basis from the communities themselves. And some of the church officials that we have spoken with are very active in that rapid response network approach because they realize that it would be more um, apt to their situation to form part of a team rather than taking in every single family that perhaps finds themselves in this situation. Secondly, once a person is in immigration uh, detention center, uh, there is very little access to them 
Um, if they are to pay a bond, it's different from a, um, a bond in a criminal court where you go to a bail bond company, oftentimes paid 10%, the bail bond company fronts the other 90, and then you get released on bail. In immigration, you have to pay 100% of the money. And depending on which circuit you are, um, which immigration circuit you are, your, your case is being held, the judges may not be very friendly to, to that. If they do grant bond, it's oftentimes very high in the thousands of dollars. Churches, one in which, uh, one in particular that I'm spoken to, has then collected money to pay that bond for those families so that the family member can be released and be with their family under the understanding that they may not see that money back again. So it's, it's, it's an expansion of their, their uh, sanctuary practices in lieu of providing phys- physical sanctuary for the families affected, which is, again, reactionary, not just to um, the times, but the scope of immigration enforcement that is happening. Uh, I think that from early conversations with, with folks in, on, on the ground, they are recognizing that it's just too much. It's just too much and it's just too far spread. And this is one approach that they can continue their, their ideals. Right. So, so thank you, Louise. And, and, and in fact, let's see here uh, if I can get to the next slide. There it is. Um, I think for purposes of time, what I'll do is um, just talk about what we're finding out <laughs> in phase two um, uh, uh, under the under the, um, the, the the themes that we had previously categorized our, our data. Um, and, and, and I think to, to, to repeat what Louise just said, sanctuary is not just one thing. Um, it seems to be in some ways, like in semiotics, we might say a, a kind of a, a sort of floating signifier, right? And um, that's another philosophically, it's just something that we are, we are coming to understand. Um, uh, and under protection measures, um, the, the two things I'll just highlight really quickly are, are that, um, again, protection measures are highly related to membership demographics, right? What kind of protection measures you provide for some versus others really depends on, on who you're working with. I know that's rather vague, but it's going to take on concrete detail in a second when we talk about COVID. Um, the second um, uh, emerging finding, it, and it shouldn't have been no shock to us, a lot of resolution language is not easy to implement, or let's say another way of putting it is a lot of resolution commitments are perhaps easier to draft and agree upon than to actually carry out. And a, and a, and a good case of this is, for example, in Chicago. In Chicago's um, school-wide uh, district sanctuary proclamation um, um, included the resolve to eliminate the gang database the gang database of, of Chicago. Now that didn't happen. Um, in fact, the present mayor uh, is continuing to use the uh, gang database. So it's just one example of how difficult it can be to um, actually carry out some of these resolution commitments, particularly if they're, if they're quite ambitious um, uh, uh, like this one. So I'm just gonna leave it at that because for purposes of time, and Luis, I don't know if you wanna add anything to this particular slide here. Uh, just one last finding uh, for the emerging findings of, of phase two it is, uh, as Bruce mentioned, we're, we're having this we're having this talk via Zoom, and I imagine that given the scope of of, of this work, it would have been on Zoom regardless whether we were in pandemic or non-pandemic times. But recognition that the pandemic has changed everything for everybody, including. Um, folks in the church and in schools, and that has changed how sanctuary can and cannot be enacted. Um, one of the things that we found really striking was that there was the recognition of um, public health measures. And with that came understanding that folks were either coming through Zoom, folks uh, would have possibly lost their jobs, therefore would be unable to contribute to the church, that then helped the, the sanctuary seekers being able to, to, to be housed in the church. And some churches are getting very creative and responsive to that reality and finding other streams of income to be able to continue their, their services and to be able to continue providing sanctuary. Food banks is one thing that, that folks are, are, have shifted their energies. And one thing that, that we'll explore in the next phase of the research is, uh, is there perhaps now a hierarchy of needs within the church that COVID has highlighted, like ideals versus realities? Is that a competition or is that more of a, of a and situation? Yeah, in fact, what I did here is I just, I just quickly scrolled down to 
a, a, a slide that just has a few words on it, um, additional observations from phase two. And this is, we're already talking about COVID, so I'll just jump right in there and, and say, this is, this is unique to phase two. During phase one, we hadn't really, of course, we hadn't anticipated that the pandemic would happen. We hadn't folded it into the, the study formally. Um, now uh, you, you, you must, you must fold it in. It's, it's so important, both on the school side and the church side. Um, uh, I, I talked to some churches that had immigration majority uh, populations, one in particular, I won't name it for confidentiality purposes, but where the majority of the congregation had been directly affected by COVID. And we're talking about a, a large number of their peoples had become infected. Um, and and this is there's a lot of like public health reasons why this 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 happened. Um, uh, I don't want to perpetuate any kind of stereotypes that that uh, immigrant communities are reluctant to receive the vaccine or anything like that. In fact, I found just the opposite. It's just that um, in some communities that it was very difficult for them to get to vaccination sites, you know, or that vaccine wasn't as readily available as it was in other neighborhoods. So there's a lot of infrastructural uh, challenges. Schools. Um, because of the pandemic, uh, schools that had declared themselves as sanctuary campuses um, suddenly, I think, in some ways, found themselves on the rhetorical end of the spectrum. And we're still sanctuary, but <laughs> all of our kids are at home. And uh, and I, I talked to one school that was an immigrant majority school, uh, particularly with young people from Central American countries. Um, and, and many of those young people had to go out and work. Um, they just quit school altogether. And had to go out and work because one or more of their family members had lost their jobs. And so it became a, a survival necessity. Um, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very, in, uh, I think, good and pointed example of why student demographics and sanctuary proclaimed schools matter so much. Uh, so um, I just, uh, I, I think what I'll do is, is highlight a couple more things before we, we finish up. Um, one thing I definitely wanted to talk about, or at least mention, is this notion of physical sanctuary, because, because historically we have been led to understand the sanctuary points in the direction of a physical space, right? a sacred physical space where one can seek protection from harm. Um, uh, what was interesting was that um, in, our, in the first phase of our study, we only found a handful of churches within their, at least within the resolution language that were committed to offering physical sanctuary. Um, uh, and we began to wonder whether this was indicative of the new sanctuary movement itself as kind of moving away from um, providing physical sanctuary, but doing a host of other things. But interestingly, um, uh, phase two is giving us some pause because so far, We've actually gone out and met plenty of churches <laughs> that uh, that have provided physical sanctuary. Some presently doing so. Some who just uh, very recently did so. So I think it's too premature to to characterize the new sanctuary movement as being less about providing physical sanctuary. We can't really say that conclusively. Um, I don't, Luis, did you want to say anything else more about physical sanctuary? What the physical sanctuary looks like is very dependent on what the church looks like. And this is something that really came up in, in my conversation with Bruce. I believe it was um, during your trip in, to Chicago where I guess even the narrative of sanctuary harkens back to medieval times then then harkens back to European churches and these grandiose structures where that's not really the case in many of the places that we are uh, visiting and about to visit. They are uh, in strip malls, they are in residential areas. And that comes with a particular reality of, can the person actually reside there? So, so more to find out about, um, are they even the churches in addition to um, resisting the immigration enforcement efforts? What understandings do they have of local zoning laws, whether or not a person can actually live there? And, and that's really something that, that um, the deeper we go into it, the more we're understanding of just what a commitment and just what it means to be sanctuary. And we do not take that lightly because none of the folks that we have talked to take that lightly. It's not uh, an empty declaration. It really comes with some commitments uh, behind it. Yes, and I'll just, I'll just say one connected point to this. The commitments take a network. Um, it's, it, it takes a lot of resources and a lot of networking and a lot of planning 
to provide physical sanctuary within, within a space like a church. Uh, these are places that are embedded within larger networks um, uh, and oftentimes very well resourced ones. And so, so we have to, we have to um, uh, take that into consideration too. I just, I just muted myself. Let's see, let me, I know that we really need to wrap up. So what I'm gonna do is just, just provide a summary of, of where we think we are headed. We, um, we discovered in the first phase of our study that, that, that uh, interestingly, churches and schools do such things, shared things as appealing to, to the foundational texts as sources of transcendent authority. We found that both similarly kind of mobilize these kind of covenant communities. Um, um, of course, they make they their sanctuary subject um, is defined through their respective jurisdictions, whether it's secular or spiritual. What I, what's interesting for us now is a, di a deeper dive into these covenant communities themselves. Um, so there's very there's also very interesting points of similarity between how school authorities and how church leadership authorities are defining sanctuary. Like one of my opening questions for folks I'm talking to is, "What is sanctuary?" Tell me, what is sanctuary? Um, and it's a very interesting taking off point. Um, uh, Luis, do you want to throw in anything there as far as concluding remarks? Uh, with, with the research itself, um, recognizing that there are um, some limitations to this research, some realities, uh, and one of them, of course, COVID, and the other, Bruce mentioned very early on in the conversation, is that this uh, takes an incredible amount of trust building. And as researchers, we are taking a lot of care because of the history of infiltration of sanctuary churches. There is a history of um, government agencies trying to and oftentimes successfully infiltrating uh, churches. And academia is not exempt from infiltrators. So this is something that is not going to be treated like you would perhaps a scientific research project or some large scale um, survey research. But there is a lot of invisible, there is a lot of non-tangible trust building that comes into this. And with that is the gratitude of those who recognizing that would still speak with us because they feel the nature, they, they feel the, the, the importance of something like we're trying to do to um, expand on their sanctuary practices. So, so a debt of gratitude to those that have spoken to us and we recognize that this is a slow burning uh, process. Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's, I, I, I absolutely reflect and echo those, those concern, those, that gratitude too. Um, I think that I'll just offer a very quick apology to, to Jolie and ICS for us going, <laughs> it looks like we, we're really excited about this stuff. You know, we can't stop talking about it, but I, I do want to keep uh, time for questions and discussion. Um, I did say I was, I was going to uh, shout out to um, our graduate students, Abiyomi, Abdunarin, and Fatika Akasanova for their uh, uh, efforts in helping us with this research. And with that, I um, turn it over to the questions and discussion. Thank you, Bruce and Louise. Would love to see folks post their questions now um, to the Q and A. Um, I certainly have some questions that I'd love to uh, maybe kick things off with. I'd love for each of you to reflect a little bit on, you know, this is a collaboration between the two of you as well as with your different, you know, research subjects and the communities that you're getting to know and to talk to. Um, I, I would love for you to talk about what sort of how you are working together, you know, geographically distant and kind of talking to different communities and kind of what are some of the ways in which you are doing that? You know, sort of the like literal mechanics as well as kind of the intellectual challenges of collaboration. And I think related to that, I'd love for you to talk a bit about how your different subject positions as researchers, but also as, you know, people, your identities, um, your geographic, you know, you're visiting different sites, your relationship to some of those schools and churches, right, in terms of like the language that may be dominant, your own identity, things like that, how those inform um, your, your work as an individual researcher and your collaboration with each other to do this work? Great question, um, uh, Jolie. I will say, that um, in terms of 
Luis and I working together, uh, we, we hold f more or less regular meetings. Uh, where we're touching base, sharing at least very quickly what we're finding out. You know, again, this is a rapidly moving uh, uh, phenomenon. <laughs> so uh, what we discover one week, we'll discover something else that's even more exciting the next week. So it's, it's, it's like that. Um, we'll text, we'll, 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 we'll call, we'll, we'll Zoom. Um, uh, and, and those conversations inform the next steps. So, so we're doing it rather organically in a way. It wasn't some, of, some of these conversations weren't really formalized. We're just, just naturally happening. Um, I will uh, uh, quickly about subject position. Um, I'm, I'm very transparent, of course, and open with the folks I'm talking to about, about my role in, in, in this, in my identity, my identity and my curiosity. Um, it's very important that, that folks understand that I am who I am, right? I'm actually a university professor and I'm not an FBI agent or I'm not working for ICE or something. Uh, I think that's the kind of like, you know, uh, probably one of the identities I need to very quickly <laughs> uh, allow people to know. The other thing is that um, I also uh, talk about, you know, we want this research to have tangible value you know we want this stuff to uh hopefully do some good in society um and uh, uh i make that known in my initial conversations so, so i think motives are are very important um and i think that Luis and i are both very personally motivated and i don't mean to speak for my research partner here but i think we're, we're both very personally motivated to for our society to our, our our work to do some good in society and that and we really mean that from the heart and i, I think that people respond to that you know um uh it's 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 a good thing i, I think we respond to that okay so uh louise i don't know if you want to jump in absolutely um and, and that's such a layered question that, that I could really go on for, for a whole hour. Um, but what I will say is that it, it is important, as Bruce mentioned, that we are transparent with the folks that we are talking to about not only our intentions, but about our worldview and about our research. And, and you can't separate one from the other. Our research has our name attached to it, which is the, the, the face that we're trying to present to not just uh, academia, but the world. And uh, we, when we reach out to folks via email, we include a, a hyperlink. This is who I am. This is where you can read this article. I have done this podcast, not to garner traction, but so that they know these are the kinds of things that I am involved in. I know that as, as a person that uh, teaches at a Hispanic serving institution. Uh, I think we also have the designation of a uh, minority serving institution. We have researchers from all over the world, without exaggeration, coming to the area, coming to the school and treating our student population, treating our uh, local population as the, the research soup du jour. I want to find out about this. I heard about this in this one story. I heard about this in this one documentary and I wanna find out. And they'll parachute, they'll grab the information and then they'll run. You won't hear from them again. It's not exclusive to this area, but rather academia has kind of a, a tendency to do this. So letting folks know, this is obviously going towards our academic growth, but we wanna do something that is going to um, benefit not just churches, schools, but society at large. If not, why else would we dedicate so much time, energy, and sleep, if, if not to do some public good. So, so it, the transparency, the being ourselves, and um, the having constant communication are all part and parcel of, of, of our research approach. Great, we do have some questions that have come in to the Q&A, so I'm gonna share those. The first one um, is sort of a two-part question. One is about um, the question of sanctuary, spaces as safe spaces and they want to know how safe are these spaces you know what what does safety mean in the context i think of both a you know uh, a church being declaring itself uh, a sanctuary as well as schools and then um a related question is what is sacred about the schools if we think of those as sanctuary spaces as well so i think they're both similar i think those two parts of the question are similar in terms of what makes these spaces safe and what also in the context of schools makes it sacred um, if we think about the evolution of the term. Yeah, um, uh, Luis, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll 
I'll share some thoughts uh, very quickly and then uh, turn over to you. Um, the The question of safety is is very interesting one because I because I think it intersects with with the kind of moving target of how we define sanctuary. Um, and in fact, I just had a very recent, very interesting conversation with some some uh, uh, law professors about this. Um, I, if, well, let, let me get to this, my, the point I really wanna make in a second. Let me say this, that, that, that in the school, school contexts, they're safe to a degree, right? They're safe so long as children are, are there physically on campus. Um, ICE um, is not supposed to, or really legally can't just sort of waltz into a school and, and, and drag people out for deportation or questioning. They can't do that. But they can park across the street. And I, I talked to a school in Chicago where this was, this was happening. There, there'd be a, an immigration control and enforcement van, van parked at a strip mall directly across the street from the school. So, so we have to think about safety in sort of spatial terms there in that really um, uh, safe there, but the one you walk across the street and um, uh, we, we cannot protect you in the same way. Now that relates to the, larger, the deeper point that I'm, I, I wanna try to make here. And that is that, um, and so it's, I think it's an open-ended question that we we're still trying to grapple with in this study. It, will the sanctuary proclamations start giving some people a false sense of security if, if the meaning of sanctuary is too diffuse? Right? If, it's, if, it's, if it's too spread out or if it doesn't really mean uh, actual provision of safety necessarily, could it, could it lead to, in some cases, a false sense of security, and that's that's a concerning point, and it's a it's a it's 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 sort of where the philosophical meets the very practical. Um, what is sacred about schools? Well, that's that's one of the questions that we're trying to find out. <laughs> I'm particularly interested in that. Um, I think because I'm interested in in in, in religion in in public school spaces. Um, uh, I don't have a, an answer for that yet. Ex I don't, I don't, and I don't think we've really arrived there yet, except that we're fascinated that there's, there's so much important mirroring between the ways in which communities are being mobilized between schools and churches. They seem to mobilize their communities in very similar ways. And, and there might be something mysteriously sacred about that yet, but, but I think it's way too premature to, to put a label on it. I don't know, Louise, if you wanna chime in there. I lost my mute button on my screen, but I found it on my uh, laptop. I'm looking at some notes that that I've jotted down, and um, Jolie, you, you're you're touching on something that we still haven't quite put our finger on. Like it's there, the question is there, but I I feel it's so nuanced, deep, and even uh, conflicting. So what's sacred about education? We're not quite there, but I can tell you what is safe about education. And I pinpoint that exclusively to um, uh, a group of students pushing back on immigration enforcement efforts in El Paso, Texas, where I grew up, um, in Bowie High School is the name of, of the high school. And what happened was that the group of students pushed back on immigration raids that were happening on the school grounds. Bowie High School is located just feet away from Mexico, uh, on the US-Mexico border. That, from that pushback, there was a um, class action lawsuit that then was um, turned into uh, the sensitive locations memo that, that we alluded to earlier. So in the sensitive locations memo, uh, cites that uh, decision by Judge uh, Bunton in the class action lawsuit that says that church, that schools are a place of learning and that they should not be disrupted specifically because of immigration enforcement efforts that cannot justifiably pinpoint why it is that they are conducting their efforts inside of schools. In, 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 in a more direct way, there is racialized enforcement by virtue of you being on that school because the majority of that school population was Mexican-American, in the case of Bowie High School. So that's where that protection comes from, that safe space that you cannot physically determine somebody's immigration status. 
and what we're trying so hard to do th throughout the, the back and forth and, and the intellectual conversations is how do we braid that? How do we take that safety that comes from this very specific event with this idea of a sacred space in the church? Because then that sense of locations memo includes churches, schools, uh, and, and places of, of worship and uh, cultural rituals. So weddings, no, no. Uh, uh, baptisms, no, no. None of those places can have immigration enforcement efforts conducted on them. Yeah, it's it's interesting how inadvertently the uh, the, sen the sensitive locations memo seems to, to strengthen um, or add. Yeah, yeah, I think strengthen our our our, our ideas that that these are are kind of sacred cultural spaces. You know, it's it's so fascinating. That the, the sensitive locations memo includes such important uh, cultural rituals as as weddings and and funerals. Um, that that's fascinating. That schools are then also mentioned. Um, uh, also, hospitals. We should uh, uh, point out, which I I mean I um, <laughs> I'm not surprised that hospitals are mentioned. I'm glad they're mentioned. <laughs> uh, it'd be horrible to see that kind of thing happening. Um, any rate, so so there's it, it did raise a lot of interesting questions. I think the first phase of our study. Yeah. Uh, a couple more questions have come in. One um, wants to know how your interest in this topic emerged um, that turned into kind of a research interest. Does it have connections to personal feelings, views, and passions? Louise, you want to take that one first. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I don't know who to address since it says anonymous attendee, but um, you, you can't separate uh, history. You can't separate uh, yourself from your research. You're drawn to your research for a reason. Uh, it, it's, if, if we're invoking this idea uh, of, of the sacred, of the religious, the, the etymology of vocation. Vocation alludes to this idea of a calling. A calling from what? A calling from whom? That depends on, on, on what... Um, what fates and what distinctions you, you wanna you wanna go for, but they share this idea of you you have a calling, and not to give my se myself a sense of like uh, importance, but I felt a calling to this having grown up in the border, having been a racialized person that has been uh, targeted by racial by racialized uh, immigration enforcement. My very first day in Ohio, I was pulled over and I was asked to present my immigration documents. My very first day in Ohio. Okay, I, I recognize the immense privileges of my U.S. citizenship, so I was easily able to tell the person, you know, this is it, that's it, go run your documents, come back, whatever, but I realized that all of these things um, shape who I am as a researcher and what I want to do ultimately with this research, which is to create some sort of measured change. I don't believe that one project can have such a tangential shift that then uh, uh, there's going to be no immigration enforcement, therefore no need for sanctuary. Of course not. But can we improve practices? Can we inform folks that are perhaps trying to have a sanctuary, but don't have a starting point? Maybe those folks took a class with one of us or a friend of a friend and said, hey, read this article so you can kind of get started on some ideas. So um, the personal is part of why it is that I do research. Yeah, I would. I was almost going to say tongue in cheek that I I I found my calling as a white middle class male, <laughs> but that's that's a little bit too tongue in cheek, and it's not quite honest. I mean, I I grew up in a in a very liberal household in a liberal city um, that was doing a lot of progressive things, and I was exposed to that from a very early age, and it just became a part of my my value structure. And so it's it's very personal to me, not in the way that it's, it it could possibly be personal to Louise. It's a different kind of personal. Um, but I, I equally feel a, a, a great need and concern um, uh, and a calling to, to, to work on these things. Um, uh, but it's, it's from, I, I'll just have to attribute my own upbringing in a, in a rather um, curious and um, decidedly liberal household. <laughs> we have another question here um, that sort of gets to that question of what you hope this research will do, right? You you both uh, alluded to kind of wanting to do good in the world. And so um, Nicole wants to know, you know, what are some of those possible results that you may be anticipating? Um, is it to help 
protect sanctuary spaces, inspire more or perhaps different advocacy safe spaces? You know, could you articulate like some of the ways in which you are imagining the research you're doing in these, uh, you know, conversations could in fact help serve um, the communities that you're talking to? I'll go ahead and, and take the, the first one to um, add some, some additional detail to the comment that I made before. The, the folks that we are uh, speaking with right now, they are so intelligent. They are honestly brave. They are very brave individuals because what they are doing is very much putting themselves at harm's way for somebody else that is even closer to harm's way themselves. So recognizing that we are not reinventing the wheel, we're not saving anybody, that we are not uh, um, improving what they are already doing, but we're rather exploring it to try to carry that knowledge that they're sharing us, that they're being so generous in sharing with us. And having that then be accessible to folks that may not have that direct line to them, that may have a closer line with us in our classrooms, that may have access to our, our, our um our, our publications, or then have that network approach of, I took a class with Dr. Colette, I took a class with Dr. Macias, and they introduced this idea. That person might then find themselves in a situation, at least there's a starting point. They can have an informed understanding of what is sanctuary to then perhaps build off of that, reach out to those folks that we reached out to, if they really take those steps to create sanctuary, or if nothing else, as part of us, our citizenry, just be informed about our realities, just be informed about something that may not form part of your immediate life, but that is happening very well in your backyard, very well in, in front of you, but because of your own privilege that oftentimes houses you in, 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 um, in isolation from others, prevents you from being able to recognize that. Yeah, uh, yeah I, think it's, I think it's very well said. I, um, I almost lost the, the question here for a minute, but, but but in terms of yeah, what what practical things can come out of this? Um, you know, we uh, are kind of telling it like it is. You know, we we're faithful to the methodology, um, uh, and and we you, there's a, there's a certain impartiality that you need to <laughs> maintain as a researcher. Um, uh, you know, you can't sort of second guess or or, or presume everything you're going to find out. Um, and I, I approach my teaching in generally the same way. Uh, um, you know, I have personal motives for the work I do, but I also, uh, there's certain content that you really need to uh, introduce, in, you know, impartially. Um, uh, I, I also will say that I don't think that we're going to end up with a document that lays out best practices. Um, I, I think that we might, it, it'd be interesting to see what kinds of practices emerge as um, as as very uh, ones that with a lot of traction. But I'm, I'm a little bit weary of the best practices thing because we're finding out how important context is. You know, the more that we're out in the field, the more we are introduced to these rich and very interesting and nuanced contexts. So time and space and context really matters a lot. So I, I don't know if that'll end up, you know, with a, I don't think it'll end up with best practices kind of document, but I do think that um, uh, uh, we should be able to uh, point uh, people in the direction of how to uh, create inclusive and safe and welcoming environments for, for newcomers, for sure. Thank you both so much. And thank you everyone um, for joining us. I have a few words of thanks to give. Um, uh, if you are interested in events like this and other things that ICS is putting on, you can follow us on our social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We're at ICSBGSU. Um, you also, if you want to get on our mailing list to find out about events like this, you can just email us at ICS at BGSU.edu. Um, to learn more about Dr. Collette and Dr. Macias's project, um, in a couple of months, we will have a podcast episode for the BG Ideas podcast where you can learn more. And if you're not already following us, wherever you like to listen, whether that's Spotify, um, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, uh, you can look for BG Ideas, subscribe, um, follow, and you will get those episodes in your feed. Um, you can, and, okay, and I wanna thank the ICS staff for helping to organize this event and run things sort of quietly behind the scenes to make sure folks could get into the event um, that, 
you know, um, there weren't any uh, tech challenges. So I want to thank Carrie Hanlon, Joanna Simpson, Alexander Schweitzer, uh, C. Wells Jensen, and Lauren Degener for all of their assistance, um, visible and hidden, um, to make this event possible. I also, I know there are some questions here. We'll keep those up. I don't, we won't have time to answer them now, but I hope you will reach out, um, share those questions with um, Bruce and Luis. Um, and I also saw that in the chat, um, McKenna Rose Flores has interested in talking to folks who have attended here who would like um, to chat about it. So if you're interested, you can directly, um, we'll leave the chat up for a few minutes as folks are departing if you wanna make connections there. Thank you all very much and have a great night. Thank you very much, Jolie. Thank you, ICS, for this. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you all. Have a great one.